Today is April 28th, 2022. I am Gabrielle Fellows with the Museums of Lake County, and this is an oral history interview with Elizabeth Paddock. Elizabeth, thank you for being here today. Yes, glad you came. What can you tell us about your name? Were you named after anyone? I was named after both of my grandmothers, Elizabeth and Edna. What is your date of birth and how old are you? My date of birth was December the 28th, 1933. When Christmas comes again, why, I will be 89 years old. Right now, I haven't reached it yet. Where were you born? I was born on a ranch five miles south of Lower Lake one mile off of Highway 53. It was not Highway 29 then, it was a county road and it was called 53. What were your parents' names? My father was Berenger Patterson. My mother was Dorothea Elizabeth Amalia Kochner Patterson. Do you have any siblings? My, I have one sister surviving. Her name is Amalia King. And where does she live? In Shingle Springs. Do you ever see her? Do you ever visit with her? Yes, I do. I had lunch with her not long ago. My niece and I drove over to Shingle Springs, and then we went on to Placerville and had a very nice lunch and a very nice visit. Where did your ancestors come from? My mother and all of her people before her came from Germany. On my father's side, all of his mother's people came from Germany, and all of his father's people came from Scotland and Ireland. Hmm. Where were you raised? I was raised here in Lake County. Have you lived here your whole life? No. I have not lived here all my life. I've lived in many places. Whenever, wherever the telephone company needed me, that's where I went. I spent five years in Santa Rosa. I spent 10 years in Eureka. I spent 12 years in Wairica. And I spent another five years with them in El Centro. Who would you say raised you and why? Who raised you and why? Who raised me? Yes. I, I lived, we, my sister and I lived with our grandmother, uh, Edna Berenger Patterson, and we always had a live-in housekeeper. The live-in housekeeper had a cabin behind the main house, and uh, she took care of most of the things within the house and my grandmother did the gardening because that's what she wanted to do. What did your father do for a living? My father was a rancher for two years during the war. He was with the first ship, the USS Anderson. It took him over to Hawaii, and he was a first-class ship fitter in Pearl Harbor, lived at Hickam Field. We sent his mail to shop number 45, Honolulu, TH. And people don't even know what TH stands for. Well, I'll tell them. It stands for the Territory of Hawaii because Hawaii was not a state then. It was a territory. And he was there working for two years as a ship fitter. 
And uh, then he came home for a short rest and uh, signed up with the Merchant Marines and uh, sailed twice to the South Pacific with supplies. The war had about two more years to run, so they took supplies over to uh, the Philippines, over to New Guinea, uh, all of those outposts that we had taken back from the Japanese, and unfortunately on the trip home, they always brought the caskets back. And they made two ships, one on the USS Wyden and the other one on the USS Dodd. And then by that time the war was over and he came back to his ranch so he could go deer hunting again. And he spent time catching up on the deer hunting. We didn't pay much attention to whether it was deer season or not. I could tell you a lot more, but I'm not going to, about deer hunting. What's well, not the hunters that have killed off the deer, it's the wild drivers that have hit them with their cars. We don't have any deer left in Lake County like we had in those years. So. What did your mother do for a living? My mother was a housewife. She learned to speak English and became very interested in politics. She was a very devout Republican and she did everything she could for the Republican Party right to the, her last days. What do you know about how your parents met? My, uh, they, uh, met because my father was a single man who his parent was badly wounded in World War I, and his parents believed that he needed a housekeeper because he couldn't, couldn't take care of the ranch and take care of his house. So he hired my mother as a housekeeper and he married her very shortly afterwards because he found out what a good cook she was and what a hard worker she was. Typical German. What are some of your earliest childhood memories? What are some of the... Your earliest childhood memories. Oh, what that would be grammar school in Lower Lake. Best school in the county. We had um, approximately 50 enrolled in the whole school. That's eight grades. We had two classrooms. Gladys Berger, bless her heart, was my teacher for four years, first, second, third, and fourth. Couldn't have had a better teacher. She lived up in High Valley. She had two beautiful girls that attended high school in Lower Lake at the time I was in grammar school. She had a son in the service and she had a husband in the service. So she and the two ladies lived up in High Valley all during the war. And uh, she not only was our teacher, she was also the principal of the school. And in the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, in another room, Hugh Rose was our teacher. And uh, he had taught in the old school 
that's now a museum east of Lower Lake, known as the Lower Lake Schoolhouse Preservation. The the Schoolhouse Museum? A, a museum? I'm, is that, I think that's what they how they call it. I just call it the I just call it the lower the Lower Lake Museum. It's an amazing building full of even more amazing treasures. And uh, that's where Hugh Rose taught before the new schools were built. Oh. The new high school and the new grammar school were built in the late 30s and about maybe two years later is when I started to school there. My daddy said, I was so accustomed to being a little cowgirl on his ranch and riding horseback and being out alone that for the first six weeks I was in school. I was only five years old. There was no kindergarten. That was first grade. I <clears throat> wasn't six until December and school started in September. Daddy said I cried every day for six weeks. And they considered taking me out of school because I seemed to have such a hard time adjusting to all the other kids that were around me that I'd never seen before in my life. I didn't know them. And they scared me. And uh, Daddy had a conference with the principal, Mrs. Berger, and they decided it was best not to take me out of school, that I was just going to have to cowgirl up, stay with the program, and ever since then, believe me, nobody pushes me around. And uh, I can hold my own with the best of them, but I had a hard time that first few weeks of school. Did you have a best friend as a kid? Did, Did I you have a best friend as a kid? A best? A best friend? Mm, I think I could say that Virginia Vernon... And we called her Ginger. She was in our class, and she was a great big girl. And she didn't miss home. She liked school. So I think she helped me get adjusted to the idea of being uh, in school all day long. We had, it was a long day because we rode the same school bus that the high school kids rode. We only had two buses. One of them went out Morgan Valley, Spruce Grove, down where I lived in Excelsior Valley, which is down toward Middletown. That was that was one bus. Mrs. Vernon drove our bus. Mildred Vernon and Walter Vernon drove the other bus. And he took the bus up to uh, Point Lake View and Sigler Springs. That was the direction that he uh, traveled in with the students. So there was quite a bit of mileage covered because the population was very sparse and everybody wanted their kids to go to school. So a few of them drove their kids as far as a bus stop 
where more than one family gathered uh, so that the gas being rationed because the war was on, we all got to go to school, but everybody pitched in together and kept those buses going. And Mrs. Vernon was an amazing lady. We got a lot of rain in those days. We had a lot of flooded roads. And I can remember us kids yelling, Mrs. Vernon, go faster, go faster. <laughs> we loved it when the water came over the radiator. <laughs> but it wasn't too smart because if you got flooded out, you'd still be sitting there. So she used to just ignore us when we she would tell we would yell at her to go faster. But uh, the bus, Mr. Vernon had about three or four buses up in by his backyard and he would have to cannibalize them every once in a while and steal a tire off of one or uh, something else off of another one because the buses were old and you couldn't get parts and he was a damn good mechanic so he kept those two buses going all through the war. I don't know how he did it. But uh, we had the greatest school system. We had, we had people that were on the school board. They didn't expect to get paid. They didn't expect to be reimbursed. They just wanted to run the school. We didn't have the Federal Department of Education screwing things up. We, the, we ran our schools locally, and they were run by local people as volunteers who understood what the problems really were and got in there and did something about them. So, I cannot say enough of good about the Lower Lake school system. It was just known as the Lower Lake Grammar School and the Lower Lake High School. No such thing as Kanaktai School District. And all these yellow buses sitting around in a lot not being used. Hmm. It was... Uh, it wasn't bureaucracy then, it was common sense. And uh, we had a wonderful school system, and the local people like Milo and Annie Morrill and uh, Donnie Kanar and uh, Walter and Mildred Vernon, Luella Adamson, uh, they kept they kept the school going, and by golly, we lived through it. And uh, amounted to something. What was your favorite subject in school? My favorite subject has always been history and English. Did you have any hobbies as a child? I lived on a horse. I don't know if you could call that a hobby, but I spent every moment uh, with my horse that I uh, possibly could. I guess you could say keeping a scrapbook was, was a hobby. I still have my scrapbook that I made during the war. And it has in it the name of different young men who died uh, in the war. Uh, my favorite one was a neighbor. Uh, he was in the Marines. If he would have lived another two months, he would have outlived the war. But the Japs killed him 
in June, just before the war was over in August. His name was Corporal Merrill Craig Reynolds, and he was a member of, his mother was a member of the Brookins family, and the old-time Lake County people. And, but I had, I have a lot of people in my, in my scrapbook. So, that was one of my hobbies. I have always done a lot of reading and uh, a lot of clipping of things out of the paper. So, that was one of my more passive hobbies. But my my real love was horses. Were you involved in any after school activities? No, because I live so far out in the country. I was just lucky to have a school bus that got me to school and got me home again. And uh, the only thing we did on Sunday, we always went to church. And we belonged to Methodist Youth Fellowship. And uh, we, in Lower Lake, that church has burned down. It's been replaced by a beautiful new church. But the original Methodist church is burned down. Hmm. And uh, my husband and I uh, were baptized in that church. And we were married in that church. But it burned down just a couple years ago, so. Hmm. But uh, we were we were active in uh, on Sunday when we got old enough to drive ourselves to to <coughs> to church <coughs> before that we were catholics because our neighbor mary murphy mary foley murphy was a devout irish catholic so when the war was on and we were too young to drive a car, we were Catholics. Because dear Mary, we called her Aunt Mary. She made sure we made it to church on Sunday. Hmm. Yes. Did you have any goals or dreams for when you grew up? Have any. Any goals or dreams for when you grew up? Honey, what did I have when I grew up? Any, did you have any goals or dreams? Any goal? Or dreams for when you grew up? Oh, uh, well, sure. Travel around the world. Travel, it goes with history. When you love history and you love geography, you love to travel. And my husband was the same way. And he told me when we were in the sixth grade at Lower Lake Grammar School, we were 11 years old. He said, we're going to get married someday. Aww. <laughs> and he loved history then, but he was good at other subjects too. He was, he was just a very smart, I wasn't very smart. I just had history, geography, and English up here, and that 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 was my and the other I don't think I tried hard enough. I didn't like math, didn't care for math, but he he was good at everything he could do anything he he was yep yeah, he was he was special. He was very, very special. This ranch wouldn't look like it does if it wasn't for him. And it looked even better before the fire came through and burnt it down and then had to be replaced again. But some of the things can never be replaced. Did you go to college? Where did I, where did he go? Where did, did you go to college? And no, I went, 
At 17 years of age, I went right to work for the telephone company. Oh. And I worked for the telephone company, like I told you, in all those cities, wherever they sent me. I worked there <clears throat> until they said, we're consolidating. This office here in El Centro must be closed down and you must go to San Diego. Mm. And I said, I'm not going to San Diego. I'm not going anywhere. My husband drives every day from El Centro to Yuma to teach school. That's going from west to east. And I ain't going to go from east further west because I would be traveling the same hundred miles that way as right. he was traveling that way. Right. And, uh, no, I said I've got my 30-some over, 30 years in, and I've got a full pension coming, and I'll take it. Oh, so you worked for the telephone company for 30 years? Over 30 years, Over 30 yes. years? Okay. Yes. And I, I, like I say, I worked in Santa Rosa five years. I worked in Eureka about 12 years. I worked in Wairica another 10 years. I worked, I, I worked in uh, El Centro for four years. So I worked in all those places, and they added, added up to over 30 years. I had plenty of time to retire. Mm -hmm. So... I got a full retirement, and I'm considered grandfathered because I retired before they broke up the bell system, and I couldn't have retired at a better time. If I'd have stayed on another two years, if I'd have taken their offer and said, oh, yeah, I, I'm only 48 years old, I don't, I don't, couldn't want to retire, you, you send me to San Diego. If I'd have taken them up on that... Mm -hmm. I would be retiring under the poorest retirement system in the world because these oh. people that retire with AT&T now, they get nothing. Oh, wow. As it is, I get free phone service. My insurance, my health insurance is paid for. My medicine is paid for. Wow. I, I couldn't have it better. And, oh, they're, honey, they're waiting for us to die they're waiting for us to die because they got about 50,000 of us that are under that wire. And they took it to the Supreme Court. Mm, they did. And they tried to get the Supreme Court to break it, to break that contract. Oh. And the Supreme Court said, no, that pa contract was made under the old company. And when the old company was broken... You formed a new one, and when you formed a new one, you got their obligations. Hmm. You got the responsibilities that they had. You're not just going to get the, <laughs> the customers. You're not, we're not going to let you just make the money and uh, mm -hmm. not pay your debts. So uh, we're right. very lucky. You know, we retired when, when we did. Because if we hadn't, uh, it, it it wouldn't be wouldn't be nice like it is now for me and and like I say they 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 want us old grandfathered ones to die off so that they don't have that. We're we're a a rock hanging around their neck. <laughs> yeah. 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 So anyway, the old telephone company was was the greatest. I couldn't have worked for a for a better company. So tell me about your husband. What was his name, and how did you meet? We met in school at the sixth grade in nineteen forty four. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and. When did you decide to get married? What? Yeah, how old were you? We uh, and 
our class in 1976, and that was the 200th, ironically, I think this is very ironic, for two people who loved history like we do and loved this country like we do. In 1976, our country was exactly 200 years old. And everything you saw, cups, dishes, t-shirts, Happy Birthday, America, 1776-1976. That's when our high school class, the class of 1951, had their 25th high school class reunion. And it's the only class reunion we ever had. The high schools had reunions, but it, it wasn't our class only. Mm -hmm. This was for our class only. <coughs> and uh, and he and uh, there were twenty five in our class. There were twenty seven of us that started as freshmen and 22 of us graduated. The Korean War had started uh, the year before and had taken some of our young men. So we were down to 22 graduates. There were about 25 of us there at that reunion when we had it. And uh, <coughs> very few people's wives or husbands came. A lot of them were just, just the graduates were there. Of course, the, the, the spouses were welcome, but they, they, they either weren't married or they just didn't, they didn't come. And there was a beautiful lady that was with my husband, who was to be my husband, and uh, I didn't recognize her. It was his sister. Oh. And and uh, she started asking me questions. And she uh, said, now, when you see your sister, you be sure to tell her I said hello. And I said, well, I would. But I said, I don't know who Richard married, so I don't know who you are. And she said, oh, Liz, she said, 25 years, I haven't changed that much. She said, I'm Sharon, Richard's sister. And then I looked at her and I thought, well, of course. <laughs> that, uh, Richard was the only person I ever saw that had the greenest of green eyes. He had the most beautiful green eyes, and so did she. And I looked at her and I thought, well, shoot, she's got his green eyes. That is his sister. <laughs> she said, Richard's never gotten married. She said, I'm Sharon. And I said, oh, Richard hasn't gotten married. I said, let's go over to the bar and have a drink. <laughs> And uh, so I told her, I said, uh, well, Sharon, my first husband died just a year ago. I said, that's a coincidence for you. I said, he died just a year ago. I said, isn't that nice? I said, I knew there was a reason I was glad he died. I can remember when he died, I said what Martin Luther King said. Um... What what is uh, uh what is Martin Luther King's favorite expression? I have a dream. Free at last. Oh. Free at last. <laughs> Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. <laughs> and that's what I was. That's what I always said about my first husband. So, <laughs> so I.
<laughs> so I had to laugh over that. That's that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So anyway. So what was your second husband's name? Loney. That's the man I'm I'm married to forever as far as I'm concerned. His name was Richard Paddock, and he's the one that the, that the blacksmith shop up there at Ely Stage Stop is named after him. Oh. Have you ever been up to the Ely Stage Stop Museum? Yes, I've been there. And uh, they, I, I don't know if they put the sign up yet, because I don't know if the blacksmith shop is finished. Oh. But okay. they have a, they had the, a sign uh, that, um, Cheyenne Parker. Do you know Cheyenne Parker? Mm -mm. Oh, she's a very active lady. Um, very beautiful blonde, real beautiful blonde. And um, she made a sign, and it says uh, Richard Paddock Blacksmith Shop. Oh, okay. And it's going to be in front of that the blacksmith shop. Uh, because he donated the um, forge and the anvil, and he had donated a lot of tools, blacksmith tools. If we hadn't have had a fire that burnt his shop to the ground, the museum would have gotten a lot more things. But I wanted to donate, it, donate these handmade tools. Some of them were almost 200 years old. His his grandfather had made them because he was a blacksmith. And um, the Bla the uh, museum didn't want to take them because they had no way to lock them up. And because they were small, they would be easily stolen or easily disappear, uh, whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't take them. And uh, they burned up in the fire. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, which uh, which fire was that? And uh, uh, the fire was in 2018. Oh, okay. That's what came through this valley in 2018. Okay. That's why I had this dumb cat out here. I'm not a cat person. I'm a gun, dog, and horse person. But I do not like cats. But when I came back home after being gone a week... This place was completely burnt down. The only thing that was left was this house and that office. Every other building, my my uh, most of my fruit trees were burnt. All of my fence was burnt. My chicken house full of hundreds of chickens, they burned up alive. And uh, the building and everything, the chickens and everything went. Oh, wow. So I lost everything, oh. and when and of course my fields were all black. <clears throat> oh, the trees were black, mm -hmm. and I, like I say, I'm not a cat person. Uh, but wandering around was this poor cat, and whoever she belonged to, there were five houses down the valley, not right close together, but. There were five all together, and evidently she almost burned up in one of them because her tail was all burnt off, and most of her hair was singed. Mm. And um, uh, my inclination is to shoot a stray cat because they kill the quail. They kill all the good grounding birds like the doves. But for some reason, I couldn't kill that. I couldn't shoot that cat. That poor, pathetic thing. She was looking for a drink of water or looking for something to eat. So I put a... I found something in the refrigerator. Gave her... I don't keep cat food. Didn't. So I put it in a pie pan, and I put it out. And I did that a couple of days. The next thing I knew, she was sitting on my porch. She decided she'd found a home. <laughs> Somebody loved her. 
So I went down to the store and I asked Lucy, I said, by any chance, do you have any cat food? And she said, I have one sack left. And I said, well, I'll buy it. I said, I never bought a cat of anything to eat in my life. And so I've been buying cat food for her ever since. And and she so she thinks she lives here. She she's not allowed in the house. She because she's too much of an outdoor cat. She brings all kinds of dead guts, and she eats them oh. and bring and brings the guts for me to see them. <laughs> to let me know that she's she's a hunter, mm -hmm. and so I I keep her because she doesn't kill the birds. The birds are all over, and she doesn't pay attention to them. Anyway, I'm all probably way off your subject of... What What did Richard do for a living? Well, he taught high school. He was, he was a high school teacher for over 30 years in, Kofa, Arizona, in uh, Yuma, Arizona at Kofa High School. And, and he trained quarter horses for a hobby. Uh -huh. We raised registered quarter horses when we had, when we were, when he was here. We had beautiful registered quarter horses. I have all kinds of pictures. Over 900 ribbons he won. Wow. Yeah. He always won at the county. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, I, he, he could do anything. He did beautiful wrought iron work. That, that's his blacksmithing. Oh, okay. He he did beautiful wrought iron work. Did you have any children? No. Oh. I don't have any children at all, and neither does he. Hmm. No. No, when somebody said, why didn't you ever have any children? I said, there are too many short people already in the world. We don't need any more short people. And she was very tall and skinny, this woman I'm talking to. Yeah. She said, well, what's wrong with short people? I said, they're mean. <laughs> so tell us about the hard work that went into the Long Valley Ranch. How, how did you and your husband acquire it? How did we acquire this place? Yeah. Through hard work. Um and saving our money. Um, Richard's, uh, on his mother's side, he's from a very old Lake County family. He dates way back to the very, the, the first pear orchard people. His mother was a Shawl. And the Shawls and the Careys and the Mannings and the McIntyres and the Acres, they're all the old, old Lake County families. And uh, his cousin Bob Morrill, the Morrills are another old Lake County family. They, they have 40 acres next door. Did you have animals here? Did you raise animals? That's when we had our registered quarter horses. Oh, okay. That's why we have all these fences up. And, and, uh... What's a quarter horse? <laughs> you don't know what a quarter horse is. No. <laughs> well, you've really started something, because I could talk all day about quarter horses. <laughs> they are a breed that started in this country the first... Re first registered quarter horses they started in 1940. Some very wealthy ranchers from Texas, New Mexico, Colorado area had these very fine horses that were very good for ranch work but they had a tremendous amount of speed so on Saturdays and Sundays, they used to have fun making money running these horses. And they called them quarter runners 
they weren't quarter horses, they were quarter running horses. The quarter means a quarter of a mile. Oh. The way these horses are built, they're not long-legged like a thoroughbred. I'm sure you know what a thoroughbred looks like. He runs at the Kentucky Derby. He runs in, at all the big tracks back east. The people back east, uh, they, they're they more the thoroughbred type, the long-legged, and they run them much further than a quarter of a mile. Some of them run as far as two miles. A quarter horse could never hold up for it. They are a stocky built, very, very strong, sturdy horse, low key compared to a thoroughbred. They're not all. I don't know whether you ever watched them putting thoroughbreds into the starting gate, but they, uh, they don't. Oh, thoroughbreds are just, to a quarter horse person, they're just dingy. <laughs> <clears throat> they're just wired. They're just wired. Oh. Well, the point of the quarter horse was he had this tremendous burst of speed, but he was only good for that for about a quarter of a mile. And then after that, he would slow down. But a thoroughbred couldn't begin to start like that. And um, one of my friends was Rusty Bays, and he was a thoroughbred man, a, bi a big winner, a big, big winner. And he had a friend that was going to ride a quarter horse. In a quarter, they were looking for some jockey. They needed a rider, and uh, Rusty Bays said, have you ever ridden a quarter horse? And he said, no, I've always been a thoroughbred man. I've never ridden a quarter horse. He said, well, I'll tell you something. The burst of speed that they start with, you will be sitting behind the saddle because he said that horse will lunge forward with a burst of speed like nothing you've ever had. And the guy found out that was the truth. So a quarter horse is very good for a quarter of a mile. He can't be beat. Hmm. But but after that, he's, he's heavy, he's heavy built, and he, and he just, he has the muscle to start out, but he doesn't have the capacity, the heart, I guess, to to run for two miles. So anyway, that's what a quarter horse is. When somebody, and there's no finer ranch horse because he's so level-headed. Hmm. There's things that the quarter horse has to do. Uh, a, a thoroughbred, you couldn't throw a rope over a thoroughbred's head, he'd go crazy. Mm. But those quarter horses, they're used to all kinds of things like that happening, and they they just ha are more calm and cool, and they're wonderful ranch workers, wonderful ranch. And so anyway, that uh, there's nothing finer than a quarter horse. If you had time, I'd show you my pictures, but we got to get on. This is this is probably taking twice as long as you think it would. <laughs> um, what can you tell us about living in Lake County? Are there any interesting stories you enjoy remembering? Uh, of living in Lake County. Oh, oh my, my whole of course, I could write a write, write a book about it. And there's some stories that I know that I would have to be very careful not to say names. For instance, in Lower Lake, uh, and this would have been during the war, this, we're talking about the 30s and the 40s. After the 50s, I moved away. Mm. Oh, okay. And I never came back till 
until 1990. So, oh. uh, but I came back to visit. I mean, don't get me wrong. It isn't like I never came back, but I didn't live here uh, after 1951 until 1990. So 50, 50 to 90, that's 40 years, right? Mm -hmm. So I was gone. Uh, I lived all those other places I told you about, working for the phone company, building up my seniority, and building up that pension I was aiming at. And uh, so I only came to see my family. Uh, I still had my parents, and uh, I still had family here. So I came back uh, several times a year, and and uh, and in those days, for the most part, I was single, so I didn't have the money to travel around the world. It's only the 30-some years that I married to my husband, Richard, that we traveled to Australia and New Zealand, and we'd go to Hawaii about once a year. We'd go to Europe. Uh, wow. And we, we traveled those 30 years. We traveled all the time. But... <clears throat> But the, the, those other years, I my vacation was to come here to Lake County. I, oh. I didn't, uh, for the most part, I didn't have the money to to go, go very far. Anyway. Uh, what was Australia like? Australia, what was that like? Oh, when did I go? Or? When did you go and what was it like? <clears throat> oh, it is wonderful. Um, we went in, in six, my husband passed away in nine, 2009. We went to, uh, to, uh, uh, <clears throat> Australia, New Zealand in 2006. Loved it. I love it because I speak German well enough, and my husband could, to get by in Germany, but it, it's kind of a struggle, you know, sometimes you get, sometimes you pe people that speak English better than you do, so it isn't always a problem in Europe that you can't speak their language, but it can be a problem if you get in certain spots. And what I'm getting at is when you go to Australia and New Zealand, it's relaxed because they speak English. They have a brogue, and some of them, some of them have a very much of a brogue. Uh, but you, you, you get it's English. It, it, you get by fine, and I, uh, and the food was good, and yes, uh, I loved it. The only thing I would tell an older person. It's a 14-hour flight, and it may not sound like a lot of long time to be on a plane, but it is a long time to be on a plane. And uh, unless you've just got the kind of a mind that you can bring a book and read it, or you can look at your smartphone, or you can do entertain yourself, it's because maybe you're the kind that can sleep. There are some people that can. I can't. Mm. I don't sleep on the plane. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so uh, the, the flight uh, isn't something you do every day. You don't want to go all the time unless you just happen to like to fly. But uh, the country... What wonderful and the people are the people are wonderful. Yeah. So the El Robo Grande tree, the log at the outside the museum. Yeah, the lo that uh, uh, Daddy Daddy owned the the ranch across the road. Oh. We owned 180 acres across the road from that. 
And when uh, that lawyer from back east, and I'm sure you saw the ad that he wants to sell it for $23 million. Mm. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Uh, he he bought Daddy's ranch that that where that oak tree is. He owned that. Oh, okay. Where but it was? He bought at, when my Daddy could no longer walk and get around, and he couldn't hunt anymore, and that was what he usually had it for. Uh, he, they bought my Dad's hundred and eighty acres. And that's where the vineyard is planted. There is no vineyard on the side of the ranch, which is the El Robo Grande. My dad never called our ranch anything like that. If he called it anything, he'd call it Starvation Hill. <laughs> he wouldn't say that. I would. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, <clears throat> this David Boys that owns the, all of that now, he calls that El Robo Grande and he calls his wine hawk and horse winery or hawk and horse vineyard. The grapes are actually on my uh, on my dad's side because daddy had the water and with this drought I don't know what they do for water. They, they may still have it because that uh, uh, Murphy Springs is part of it. <clears throat> but Daddy had the red soil, and the red soil is what they want. They want that red soil to plant grapes, and that's where the grapes are on my dad's ranch. But as far as that, that oak tree goes, it, it, it was just a very, very, very huge oak tree that uh, that had had to be cut down because it was rotten. Oh, okay. And they they just get old and and they get they get rotten and that's why why they cut that uh, big thing down. If they don't, it was right on the edge of that road. It would have fallen on the road. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't think it did. I think they actually cut it. But there were other ones along that along that area that that happened to. They just weren't as big as that one. That was that there were some big ones right across from my grandmother's house. Hmm. My, my grandmother's house is that. The house that we grew up in is just down the road from that. I could, if, if you, if you know where the El Robo Grande is, why my, the house that my daddy, my grandfather, and Charlie Footer built in 1938, it, it, it's just down the road toward Middletown, about a half a mile from, or less from, from where you're talking about, where that tree fell. Mm -hmm. Was the log always at the museum? Or did they have it somewhere else? Did they have it? The log, was it always at the museum? Did they always have no. it there? No. At, at one time, they had a piece of it anyway, down at the jail. Oh, okay. You know where the little jail is. Yeah. Yeah, they had it down there and decided it wasn't a safe place, so I don't know how they did it, but they got it up to the museum there. I guess they decided it was more likely to be treated good than it would down there so public. Mm -hmm. See, when we had the, the water that we should have, here in Lake County, that Sigler Creek 
that ran all the way through Lower Lake. It, it, it goes uh, behind where the jail is. There, there's an actual creek there. There's no water in it, and there hasn't been for years. Mm. But that used to be a roaring creek. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Lake County, uh, when you ask about Lake County, I can't even begin to describe to make you understand what the different water makes to a place. Right. In the springtime, we had wildflowers that were unbelievable. I could take you to places that, like I was telling you, that we used to tell Mrs. Vernon to drive faster, drive faster. <laughs> yeah, we wanted to see how high that that water would come over the bus. <laughs> Little smart kids. <laughs> So, can you tell us anything about Ruth Tennyson and Lower Lake? Oh, I remember Ruth Tennyson. Do you know where Ruth Tennyson's store was? Uh, I think so. What, what road was it on? It was right Main Street. Okay. It is right, it, it is right there. Uh, the last I saw of the store, it was a Mexican... A Mexican store. Oh, La Monarca? Was it La Monarca? I don't know what you call it. We never... Yeah, that was right. Uh, I could take you right to it. It's right on Main Street. It couldn't be any more on Main Street. It's, uh, it's on Main Street right uh, a few feet from Lake Street. Do you know which oh. one? Do you know what street is Lake Street? Yes. Okay, yeah. well, and they've done a lot of remodeling to it just in recent. You know what store I'm talking about that they did some remodeling? I haven't been in Lower Lake for six months. I, I, oh. don't, I don't know what they've done on that corner. Dur uh, right after the war, my husband's mother... My husband's father died when Richard was only six years old. And she came home, like I told you, she's related to the oldest family in Lake County. She came home and married a Hunt from Middletown, and the Hunts were a very old family. Very old. If you went down to that museum in Middletown, they call it the Gibson House, I, I donated a lot of things to that museum because when my husband passed away, I had the things his stepfather had, and his stepfather was an officer in the prison system at Vacaville, and I donated his badge and papers uh, oh, I donated. I donated. He was a champion baseball player in Middletown High School. Harlan Hunt was. I donated that. I donated all kinds of things to that little museum that had to do with my husband's stepfather. Hmm. He was a darling. He was a darling man. He was just a dear, dear person. And... um they owned that store for a while, and then he got cancer, and after he got, old, got through the cancer, he went to work for about 20 years or more for the state of California in the prison system in Vacaville. Mm. And, uh, but anyway, they had that store, and Ruth Tennyson had it for the most, the longest time. She had it for years. She had it at the very height of the war. So that's the reason she was so interesting. What, what kind of store was it? Was it a, a grocery store? It was a grocery store like no other. 
because of the shortage of certain things, Ruth Daglish refused to allow anybody to hoard anything. Nobody could get the best of anyone else just because they had the money to do it. Hmm. Chewing gum, among other things, was in very short supply. That's because they gave it all to the soldiers. The cigarettes went all to the soldiers. Uh, and all leather goods made their boots to fight in went to the soldiers. Anything that the military needed that was in short supply, the public came second. Okay, get back to chewing gum. Get back to candy. Bags of candy, and you know how they still make bags of candy with individually wrapped pieces. Mm -hmm. Well, she wasn't going to sell you a big bag of candy. That is just being a pig out of you. You didn't deserve to do that. Cut that bag and sell a piece at a time so everybody in town that wanted it got it. Hmm. And she was famous for that. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew that if she got a shipment of chewing gum, and in those days chewing gum was individual rat pieces, and, and five or six of them was in a package, I don't know, do they still make it that way? I'm not sure. I think so. I well, know. I know they make it other ways. Well, anyway, dear Ruth Daglish would open up one of those This is what I'm trying to tell you. Oh. Chewing gum did not come like that. Oh, in a small container? It, chewing gum pieces. came only wrapped in paper. Oh. And, it, and each piece was wrapped in a piece of foil. Oh. And then five of those were stuck inside of a... I... If, if you never saw chewing gum like that, I can't des describe it. Mm -hmm. um, but you never saw it like, you never saw chewing gum like that. It was, it was uh, individual sticks. We called it sticks of gum. Right. You'd say, would you like a stick of gum? Oh, I don't eat blackjack. And was do you that, know what blackjack is? What was blackjack? Well, it was a flavor of gum. It was a flavor. It was made out of licorice. It was fla black flavored uh, licorice. And I oh. hate licorice. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, yeah, they had spearmint gum, double mint gum, peppermint gum, blackjack gum, and it was all in five sticks to the package, and each one was wrapped separately in foil, mm. and then put in a package. Well, she would open that package up and sell one stick at a time. <laughs> I don't know if you was a penny, it probably was a penny. And, and, uh, so when, when you ask about Ruth Daglish, it wasn't just a chewing gum, that comes to my mind, it was other things. If it was, if she got a box, uh, I don't think you call it a box, if she got a pound of butter, uh, she would sell you one cube. Oh. You didn't, you didn't get to have that 
whole pound of butter. Uh uh. And that was just to make sure other pe more than one person got. That's stuff? right. Okay. Uh, to 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 her, that was her whole that was her whole life was fairness, because we were at war. And because you're young and you're not even taught anything in school about how war is. The, I, the young people, I don't know what they do. If Vladimir Putin drops that nuclear bomb that he says he's playing around just to scare us, he's not going to drop it. He doesn't do anything like that. No, nor is China, nor is North Korea, but it, it, it shakes up everybody. Uh, it doesn't shake up somebody like me because I've heard it so much. But anyway, you can't imagine uh, what uh, what war is like. Uh, you you can't imagine. If you drove your car into my gas station, you'd have to have a ration book and you'd have to have a stamp in there. And if you and if I looked in your ration book and I'd say, "Well, Susie, these stamps aren't for gas." And you'd look at me and say, "Oh no, they're not for gas. Those are meat stamps. I, I'm a vegetarian, you know. I don't eat meat. So I always got meat stamps left. And I'd say, well, I'm sorry, but you don't buy gasoline uh, with a meat stamp. Uh, 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 well, I used them all up. What am I going to do? I, I'm on empty. And I'd say, well, I guess I'll just push the car out in the street because you can't block up my my gas station. I got to wait on customers. Somebody's going to want to have gas and they're going to have a stamp. Have you ever seen a ration book? Mm -mm. Everybody should have kept theirs after the war because they'd be, they're a treasure. My, I know my mother kept them uh, and kept her ration books. And I had them, and uh, and I I gave them to some, her grandchildren. Uh, but anyway, they had stamps in them, and you could tell what you could buy with them because they said the meat was red, a red stamp. We'll say it was red, and we'll say the gas was green, a green stamp and uh, some other item. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure. Some of the stuff that was in such short supply, you didn't, you, could, you didn't even get a stamp for it. You just had to tr try to buy it, and y there was none to buy. So having a stamp didn't do you any good at all. Oh, okay. If, if if they didn't have it, they didn't have it. What would you know? What good would a stamp do? Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, you got so you got a new book every month, or maybe it was every other month for each member of the family. Hmm. And each member of the family, which which for the most part. People learn to be pretty careful. They learn to get by. But anyway, back to Mrs. Daglish. She, she was just a very, very unusual. She was probably short. She, she was probably shorter than I am. And she was probably twice as wide. And she kind of squeezed behind, between her little store. It was, a, it was very little, and she had everything in it. And when Richard, my husband, when his mother and stepfather bought the store, uh, they were buying the inventory. Most of it was so old, they just had to throw it out. Oh. 
she because she wouldn't throw anything a, anything away and i think sometimes she kept things that she could have maybe given it out a little bit more generously and then it wouldn't have gone to waste otherwise the bugs get in it or weevils or whatever you call it gets in flower i know that so anyway she was a very interesting little uh, lady that that tried to be fair to everybody and i'm sure she made some people mad but as time wore on they they realized that she was really trying to help uh uh and she had two sons uh, that i know of harold daglish came home from the war and started an automobile agency in lower lake and the building burnt down in that fire it was just behind her store a little ways just a, just a little way on at lake street but just a little ways from her store um he started a, a, a automobile agency for i think chrysler um and she had another son uh, that um probably better educated and he stayed in the city as i don't know just what he did but he 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 had some technical job and i don't know if she ever had any girls mm. but harold was the son that i knew i knew harold daglish uh and the other one i didn't even know him so but as far as telling telling you any more she was just an amazing storekeeper who did the best she could in war time and that's when i that's when i was there from the depression to the war and then when it was over i of course by that time the korean war started but it didn't the only thing it affected me was that it took my generation off to war because it was my generation that it took and uh, one of my favorite uh promo indian boys got killed and i felt very badly about it very badly the the thing that's sad about a country that gets involved in another country most of the people that go there to fight and die they don't even know where that damn country is if that country came here and bombed you you would find out in a hurry where it was but that was a war between north korea and south korea oh yeah they i don't know of one damn thing that they that they had done that we wanted to go over there and get involved and if you read history george washington said we must never become involved in other countries entanglements if they do something to you yeah you're not worth a damn if you don't protect yourself that's my feeling but if you and your boyfriend are fighting i'm going to leave it up to somebody else it's called the police department to to try to figure out uh who, who's wrong and who ought to go to jail and maybe i'll just put both of you in jail but but i i don't want to i don't want to get involved i don't want to send my soldiers over to your side or to his side because i don't know which one of which one of you's right and which one's wrong mm-hmm. and uh so 
uh, the Korean War came along and it was very sad because it took my generation away and it it made it a it made it a it hit home when it was my generation because World War II was entirely different somebody dropped a bomb on Pearl Harbor that was that that's and killed a lot of civilians and did a lot of damage that was our property but you know, that Korean thing is a sad, sad thing. So I don't think that she got involved uh, about that time. She was getting old, and she sold the store to Richard's oh. parents. And uh, so uh, I don't know what she would have done. We didn't have a shortage of anything. Mm. Right. World War Two was what made, what really put the pressure on people. Mm -hmm. And that's where Ruth Daglish came. <laughs> they should have given her a uniform to wear because, boy, she, <laughs> she, she, she wanted to help everybody. And on our side, she wanted, but she wanted it to be fair. So when you ask me what I remember about her, I remember her extremely well because you went in the store just buy a loaf of bread or see what you could buy. And uh, I'll tell you something, it has nothing to do with Ruth Daglish, but her beauty shop was across the street. And I'm not going to tell you her name because... I don't, she and her husband didn't have any children, but she was a terrible drunk, mm -hmm. and she had a beauty shop. Well, you know nothing about <clears throat> what I'm going to tell you, but it's the truth. A beauty shop, uh, your hair, uh, uh, I, I have straight hair, straight as a stick, okay. Um, if I wanted a permanent... I didn't put chemicals on my hair. She had a machine, and it was electric, and it had curlers on it. And she put put you neck right next to the machine, and put all these electric curlers in your hair. Hmm. And then, of course, she put some solution on. I don't. Maybe it's only water. I don't know what she did because I never had. I never had it done. My grandmother threatened my sister with, and I with death and destruction. We had beautiful long blonde hair, beautiful, and it was a natural color. And she, every time this woman would see us. Why, uh, she'd, oh, girls, come in, I fix them all oh, beautiful. Oh, because we wore, it, we wore it in pigtails. Oh, I make it beautiful, beautiful. I thought, yeah, our grandmother will kill us, too. Um, and so anyway, she would get drunk because she'd hook you all up to this machine with these electric curlers and plug it in. And she lived in the back, so she'd go back and have a few snorts while you were underneath that thing. So what the women used to do was to take another woman with her so that they could reach, because the woman that was under it couldn't always reach the plug, and she'd take a friend with her to unplug you. <laughs> Un unplug the machine before it burnt your hair up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had things like that. We had things like that in Lower Lake. Oh yeah, it was ex Neat. it was exciting. So how how long have you been on the preservation committee, and and why did you join? Well, I've been on the, before my husband passed away. Um, well, I heard there was an opening on the board, and I I know a lot about Lake Count. Not a lot, but I know a lot about Lower Lake anyway, and even a little about Middletown and the surrounding area, and 
I figured I could, I could help them and win. Uh, 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 let let's just make a, a guess. Uh, um, let's see, my husband passed away in nine. Okay, you could say, uh, you, uh, well, I, be I belong to the historical society, oh. you know, for, I'm a life member, and so was my husband of the historical society for, for years, for over 30 years, mm -hmm. but just on the, the committee in Lower Lake, um, you could, you could, I would just be guessing, uh, let's say 2005, but, but that, that's just a guess, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, I don't, I don't really know when I, I've always been supportive of it, I've always taken out of town visitors up there, oh. you know, when it was open. Yeah. I uh some people would ask me, some people that I knew went to that old school. Really? My uh yeah, sure. My where my husband's mother graduated and all of her uh, all of her sisters. Oh, I know all kinds of people that went there to that school. Wow. Sure. It on, they only closed it uh, a couple of years before they, uh, before I started to the new grammar school. What they, what's the grammar school? Because that school there was every grade. It wasn't just high school. Mm. At the schoolhouse, it was every grade. The, the museum. Right. It, it was every grade. Oh. Okay. Haven't you ever seen how young some of those kids were that were in the uh, pictures? I thought it was grades one through nine. Because we have a sign there that says that. But you're, you're what? It did it what? Was grades one through ninth grade? But you're saying it was it was all grades? Well, where would you go to graduate uh, uh, for for a? Uh, for the last two years, and where if it if it's grades one through nine, what did you do with the ones that were ready to graduate from high school? Because one through nine uh, would would only be the the uh, the grammar school and and one year in high school. Right. That all you did you you only gave them one year in high school. And yeah. then what did you do with the last three years of school? Right. I I think uh, that might be the age group that's in that picture, but oh. maybe the maybe the older ones were uh, in some other picture. I I don't know. I never heard that. I never. I never never heard that that they didn't graduate from there. Hmm. I, I, uh, I'm sure that they all, um, i tell you, um, the girl, the woman, she's not a girl, she's a woman that's next door, Shell of Craddock, her great grandfather was the first teacher there. Oh. And uh, a Dr. Morrill. Oh, right. And I, I, uh, I can't, I can't think of his of his first name. I don't know. Albert. I know. Was it Albert? Was it Albert? Albert yes, Morrill? Albert. Yes, yes. That's that's uh, that's who it was, Albert Albert Morrill, and Ellis was his son. Now I remember his son. He was very old. He died during a war. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very old. That was his son. And then Milo was the next generation. And then Robert was the one that died just about five years ago. And his daughter, Cheryl, they ran out of boys then. And they had they only had two girls. And Cheryl and her si sister Vicky are the last survivors of Albert's Albert, Ellis, Milo, Robert. That's four generations of men that carried on the moral name. And Bob had two girls. Cheryl lives there, and Vicky lives in Napa. Yeah, that's Albert. But I, uh, I, I highly question that they didn't go that they didn't graduate from high school when they went there because I'm uh because I uh, I know that uh that Bob I don't know what grade Bob was in when they closed that school and he moved to the brand new high school I don't know, uh, the brand new high school and that brand new grammar school had to open just prior to me starting to school. Mm -hmm. Were you a member of any other committees or clubs besides the historical society? Do I? Were you a member of any clubs or committees besides the historical society and the Preservation Committee? No, other, other than uh, other than the Republicans, I, uh, I'm, I'm in the politics more than I am in, and I, I'm not anymore since my husband passed away. I'm not into anything, you might say, but I, I don't know, uh, 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 I can't. Uh, uh, I I can't think of any other. Mm. I uh, when I was in Imperial, when I lived in Imperial County, I was on the grand jury, oh. and they asked me to be on the grand jury here, and I told them no, I wouldn't travel to Lakeport. When I was on the grand jury in Imperial Valley, I lived right right there in the midst of it. I didn't, didn't take me five minutes to get to, <coughs> to get to the courthouse. But, um, I haven't taken, I haven't taken any, any interest in any. I, I'm, I'm like that man that was, um, a member of the mafia, and they asked him if uh, he was guilty of uh, killing anybody, and he said, we never kill anybody that doesn't deserve to die. Well, I haven't, I haven't been on any committee that that doesn't deserve me. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what, uh... What are your thoughts on COVID? On... Uh, on COVID, the, the pandemic? That crazy thing. The most over... The most uh, overkill. That's the most overkill I ever heard of. It's, uh, I don't... I, I I don't even think uh, I don't even think it's a pandemic. I what is my thought of it? How would I how would I say it intelligently? I just
I, I, I had so many thoughts about it. I, uh, and none of it, none of it is good. I, 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 I just, I'd have, I'd have to give that. I'd have to give that some thought to th think of a nice way to say that um, you can quote me. The inmates are in charge of the asylum. <laughs> now that's what I that's what I think. The inmates are in charge of the asylum. And I'm speaking of Washington DC and I'm speaking of Sacramento. The only ones that seem to have their wits about them is somebody like Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, <coughs> he seems to, and, and DeSantis of Florida, uh, it's, the whole thing is out of all, I don't know what you want to put down there. The, the whole thing is out of all reason. Did you get the vaccine? I, I had, uh, yes, I had, uh, I only, I didn't get a boosters. I, uh, how do you like the idea now that they say that these little ones that got it, they're, they're subject to hepatitis? Right. <laughs> so and if if you wonder what I mean by my attitude that that's that's a good example mm -hmm. what things have happened in your life that have brought you the most happiness that what's happened in my life that has brought you the most happiness my eye. My, by Harry Richardson Paddock, that's what's brought me the most happiness. <laughs> well, I'm not ashamed to say that. Mm -hmm. That's, he's, he's, oh, I, I almost wa want to walk away. <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing Nothing else in the in the world. With this darn arm, I can hardly lift up anything. These are pictures of you two. Aw. That's a good picture. When was this taken? Almost taken probably 30 years ago. And Aww. That's when we got married about 45 years ago. Wow. And that's uh, the king of Norway, King Olaf of Norway. Oh, okay. And we're on a Norwegian cruise ship. Oh. Just adored him. I adored him when we were when we were in the. In the uh, sixth grade, and we were 
11 years old. And he said, I better, I'm going to put this down and put it away later because it's too complicated. I've got to get my cross and... What, what's your favorite memory of Richard? What's your favorite memory of Richard? Your, what? Your favorite memory of Richard. Oh. This is my grandmother that I was named after. That's Elizabeth. That's my mother. That's my sister. Aw. Cool. What's my favorite memory of Richard? I don't know what, what to say to that because he bought me a brand new 1976 Corvette. <laughs> That's not my favorite memory. <laughs> my favorite memory was seeing him at the reunion and remembering that he had said we were going to get married someday. And when I talked to his sister and found out his sister <laughs> was his sister, <laughs> this is my great-grandfather's manufacturing company, W.W. Patterson, it's still in operation today in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they say it's at the same address that it was when he started it over 150 years ago, about 200 years ago now, block and tackle. And What did they manufacture? They manufactured block and tackle. And block and tackles are, are pieces of metal that hold other things? They hold things up? Well, it, it is used to, to be attached to anything you want to want to lift up. This is a this is a uh, 26 ton girder being erected for the B and O Railroad in Green Springs, West Virginia. And uh, the contractor was Pennsylvania Steel Company. And uh, the the Topping lift blocks are shown on cut number 155, and they're just, uh, they're just, I, I don't know how to explain to you what a block and tackle is any better than these pictures. Right. You 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 hook whatever you're gonna pull up in in uh, on here, and and uh, the the cable goes around and around and around until it pulls whatever piece of metal you want uh, up in the air. There, you can see what that block and tackle is doing there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If that wasn't there, this, this big thing here wouldn't be suspended in space like that. 
Mm -hmm. It's suspended because it gets pulled up. Uh, placing a 90 ton um, bottom E cord section on the Beaver Bridge of Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad. So you can see there, there's a lot of things that, that that block and tackle builds that if it wasn't for that, it, it, it wouldn't be possible. Mm -hmm. What are some of your greatest accomplishments? What are some of your greatest accomplishments? Uh, whose? Yours. Duh. My greatest accomplishment. Well, I wouldn't know. Depends on... I guess it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> you, talk, you talk to me and I don't talk. I, I don't tell you that I accomplished anything. I, I, I haven't accomplished it. That's why I'm still here. <laughs> I, I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, my my greatest accomplishment. What would you describe as the best day of your life? January the 1st, 1977, when I married Harry Richardson Paddock. That was the best. <laughs> and what's, what's the best advice you could give future generations? Vote Republican. <laughs> what have I not asked you that you think is important for other people to know? What, what's important? What have I not asked you that you think is important for other people to know about you? Oh. Oh. Well, the, uh, I don't know just how to put it, but uh, we ain't we ain't great anymore. But uh, I guess uh, that uh, that at at one time, uh, we were the we were the greatest. I guess you call it civilization. I'm not gonna give it to. I'm not gonna give the cover the government uh, credit uh, that. Uh, that at one time we were the greatest civilization. That's <clears throat> existed on this planet. At one time, we were the greatest. Mm -hmm. No more. No more. You. You. Uh, Why do you think that? <laughs> doesn't uh, just seeing the amount of people coming over the border completely undocumented. They come in undocumented. They come in unsearched. 
They are not tested for any diseases. We know nothing about, you and I can't go anywhere without a mask, or for a long time we couldn't, we, we can now. Uh, but uh, they come in without mask, without a physical, to see what uh, they have wrong. We don't go through their backpacks to see how many drugs they're carrying in. We don't run them through any kind of R&I to check what they are, what, whether they're a criminal or what they are. So in other words, open borders. It's too bad my mother isn't sitting here at the table so she could tell you in her real sweet way, because my mother never shouted in her life. That was one of her problems. She was too much of a lady. She was too much of a, too much, too diplomatic. But she could very kindly tell you what she went through to get to come into the United States. And it wasn't just her, they didn't just pick on her. I'm talking about everybody. And there were plenty of people that were refused for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we, we have open borders. We have this hatred of the police, but the crime rate keeps jumping higher and higher. We've cut back their salary, we've cut back all of their supplies, everything that they have to deal with. We've got them uh, defunded, as they say. We've got them on a budget, and then we wonder why your life and my life ain't worth a damn if we walk down the streets of New York. So high crime, high inflation. We have plenty of fuel in this country, but oh no, let's import it from somewhere. Let's use up our Federal Reserve first. We'll use, we'll really puncture that, and then we buy from all of these foreign countries, and we let our pipelines go. We let a, 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 a fence that could have kept the border closed, but we're not doing anything to finish that fence. It's just wasted because it's just sitting there. So beside open borders, wild crime, <clears throat> and... Uh, a school system that's defunct. The kids graduate and they can't answer me the simplest question. I can't believe what, what, and they don't even know what you're talking about. One of my nieces whose daughter is an honor student. She's not in continuation high school. She's an honor student. And one day she says, Aunt Liz, what's your favorite music? And I said, oh, I don't really have a favorite. I said, uh, I, uh, I, love, I love patriotic music. I love gospel music. And I, I love what I call real music cowboy music, not this country western junk of uh, buncing around and banging on drums, but I said a, a guitar and somebody with a voice like Gene Autry. I said, that's my idea. But I said, I just really love patriotic music. And she said, now this is someone almost as old as you are. What's patriotic music? What does that mean? I said, well, uh, of course, I almost fell over. I, 
I couldn't even think for a minute. I said, uh, we could try the Stars and Stripes forever, a Star Spangled Banner, God Bless America, the Marine Corps hymn. Oh, 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 that's a, oh, that's patriotic music. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now, now, if I was ready to go to college and I knew no more than that, I would wonder just what the hell do they teach them in school? According to one boy's father, he said they teach him sex education and underwater basket weaving. And he said that's very important. <laughs> of course he was being sarcastic. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, when you ask what's wrong with this country, it sure ain't the country I was born into. If somebody bombed Pearl Harbor now and killed a bunch of innocent civilians and sank some of our best ships, why, uh, mo most of the young people, uh, oh, Pearl Harbor, oh yeah, that's, that's a, that's a fun place. Yeah, that, that's, that that's I I remember. Oh, we got so drunk there. Huh? Did you ever try any of the mai tais? You ought to try a heavenly horizon. That that's that's the one that's got everything in it. Oh boy. <clears throat> or they would tell you that it's a good place to buy cheap marijuana or something, but. No, uh, it, it isn't difficult at all to see uh, what's uh, wrong with this country. Uh, and are you familiar with the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? Mm -mm. Well... <laughs> What's that? <laughs> One of the greatest German sketch artists of all times was Albrecht Dürer, and he took from the Bible his idea of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and uh, he he did a, a. I've seen the drawing when we were in Germany, when we were in Nuremberg, we went to his home, and he has a. Uh, the sketch is as big as this table, but these are reproductions. He starts out <clears throat> with war. War all over the world, and we just about have it now. <clears throat> have it in enough of places. War all over the world leads to the other three horsemen. And that's pestilence, disease, and famine. He didn't paint or sketch the fifth one. The fifth one is death itself, because that's the ultimate. But it starts with war. <coughs> And we, and like I say, we have plenty of it, and we're going to have more. And the pestilence and the disease, we have the, we have the disease, and the pestilence will come along, and famine, with all of these people coming into this country, where do you think you're going to put 10 million of them? 
But where, where, where do you want to house them? You want, want them homeless? You, you think homeless is... Uh, because that homeless is about what they came from. So that's what they're used to, these people from South America. So they're going to be homeless. And uh, what are these homeless going to gonna do you uh if you pay taxes and i know i do uh we're going to have to uh furnish them you're going to run out uh you're going to have to furnish them with food mm -hmm. you can f furnish them with a cheap with a maybe a pup tent to live in if they're going to be homeless but if you think this country is headed in the right direction, you, you study that picture and see how people look. And these are a reproduction. If you can imagine, it took him a long time to make it. He made a sketch and it hangs in his home in Germany, and it's as big as it's as big as this table. Of course, it doesn't lay down; it's up. And uh, it's uh, amazing, but uh, a, a lot of it is taken out of the Book of Revelations, which is the last book in the New Testament in the Holy Bible. And uh, that is what we are going to be facing. And uh, mm -hmm. so we better get back to your questions. And Is there anything else you want to share? No. I could, I could talk and until the cows came home. Thank you for taking the time to sit down with us today and sharing your stories.